is transforming a second order linear differential equation into a linear system of first order differential equations is kind of neat. Um, let's say we have the following second order linear differential equation. Actually, I keep saying I should throw away a pen and I don't actually want to throw the mic so that I can see the income and stuff. I feel like someday they're going to work. It's magical thinking. So let's say we have this following the following second order di linear differential equation d squared x dt squared minus 2 dx dt is equal to 3x. And then when you have a problem like this, if you're not kind of given any direction, the usual thing to do is to make the choice where you let some other variable, I think you picked V in class, I would probably pick Y, but you pick, let some other variable equal the first derivative of X. So we're going to let V equal DX dt, which immediately leads us to saying, oh, well, then we can say that the derivative of that is equal to the derivative of that. But the derivative of the derivative of x is just the second derivative of x. And then we can rewrite our equations. So we rewrite and we get d squared x dt squared, which is dv dt minus 2 dx dt, which is just v equal to 3x. And then we can solve for dv dt. So our equations become that, yeah, that's right, dv dt is equal to 3x minus 2v. Uh, sorry, 3x plus 2v. Apologies. So here's our new system of equations. dx dt is equal to v and dv dt is equal to 3x plus 2v. And we could even like do some analysis on this, right? We could say, okay, let's write down the matrix. In fact, yeah. So let's say our matrix is gonna be, okay, we have to be a little bit careful. Basically, you have to think about which variable you've decided to be the first variable, right? So typically here, I would say X is the first variable because it's kind of the first one I wrote, and then V is the second one. It doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent which way you choose it. But I'm thinking definitely also the way I've written it here, I've written X first, V second. So X is going in the first spot, V is in the second. So DX, DT is zero, one, and then DV, DT is three, two. Right, again, we're just taking the shortcut, right? We are not writing out the entire differential equation, dx dt, dv dt as a vector is equal to this matrix times the variable vector x v. And that's what we're really getting at. We just, we know that already, so we don't need to write it down. And then we could totally find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So let's find the trace is equal to two, the determinant is equal to zero minus three. So our equation is going to be lambda squared minus two lambda minus three equal to zero. I feel like that's usually the way he likes to do it. He's like, let's find the trace of the determinant and then we'll just put them into that formula. And then this does factor. So I'm gonna get lambda equal to three and lambda equal to negative one. And then we could go further, right? We could totally find the system of solutions. So we could say, okay, and it's actually kind of, this is, this seem, this might feel kind of like, well, why would this? Well, I promise you there is kind of a point. I mean, I guess you could say about a lot of math, there's kind of a point. Um, let's go ahead and find the eigenvectors. So if lambda equals three, I'm going to get, 0, 1, 3, 2 times my, I'm still going to use x and y, even though I'm using x and b for other stuff, which is, it just is what I'm going to do. 
And that's going to give me, let's see, zero X plus one Y equal to three X. Great, that's perfect. I couldn't ask for a better result, right? That's just like, there's my eigenvector. So my eigenvector is one, three. I guess I'll call that B1. My second eigenvalue being negative one, I'm going to get zero, one, three, two times xy equal to negative one times xy. And that also is really easy because zero times x plus one times y equals negative x. Um, I got to say, having a zero in the top left corner there, kind of like the best case ever for finding the eigenvectors, it makes it really, really easy. Obviously, we don't always have that, but if you do, take advantage. This is going to give me x being one, y being negative one. So here's our system of solutions. A general solution. And let's be real particular that. Let's be real specific about how we write this. We're finding x is a function of t, v is a function of t, and it's equal to c1 e to the lambda 1 t v1 plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t v2, which is going to be x of t v of t. Sorry. Equal to, let's see. So I've got C1 e to the 3t times my first vector, which is 1, 3, plus C2 e to the lambda 2t, which is negative t, times my second vector, which is 1, negative 1. Now, here's what's interesting about this, or maybe not interesting, but here's something worth noting. When we started off with this, or when we started this whole process, we started with an, an equation with just x's in it, right? This is a differential equation with the variable x. There is no v there. We introduced v to be able to solve it. But what I'm trying to say is our solution, we don't actually care what v is. Or more specifically, if we know what x is, then you automatically know what v is because v is just the derivative of x. So what I'm saying is we can just ask what x is. Well. I'm just looking at the first row. X of t is equal to C1 e to the 3t times one plus C2 e to the negative t times one. So this is actually our general solution. Kind of cool. Let's check. Let's actually make sure it's a solution to what we said it was a solution to. So looking back at our, Looking back at our second order differential equation here, here's our solution. Let's actually take its first derivative and its second derivative and plug it in and see what we get. So dx dt would equal c1 e to the 3t times 3. And then minus c2 e to the 3 t. And then our second derivative would be Well, the derivative of this again would be another multiple of three. So nine C one E to the three T and then we get another multiple of negative one here. So plus C two E to the negative T. And then we should be able to plug this into that equation and have it be true. So let's find out if I plug this in, I'm going to have nine. Can you see that? No, you can't. Barely for there. Okay, I'm going to have nine c1 e to the 3t plus c2 e to the negative t minus two times 3c1 e to the 3t minus c2 e to the negative t. And that should equal three times x. And x is again, c1 e to the 3t plus c2 e to the negative t. So let's see if it works. So simplifying this, let's see. I have nine C1 e to the three T minus two times three is minus six C1 e to the three T. So I'm gonna get on the left-hand side, I'm gonna get nine minus six is three C1 e to the three T and C2 minus two times minus one is plus two C2. So that's gonna be a three C2 e to the negative T. And yeah, that's, all, that's equal to the right-hand side. So it really does work. 
So let, let me back up and I know then I'll give you an opportunity to ask your question. Also, I'm gonna back up to the part of that and see what we've done as well. So we started with this second order differential equation. D squared x dt squared minus two dx dt equal three x. We set v equal to the derivative of x, which is kind of standard, and you can use v or y or whatever. And then we said the derivative of v is the second derivative of x. So we rewrote this equation as, well, the derivative of v replaced the second derivative of x, and v replaced the derivative of x, so that dv dt minus 2v is equal to 3x. And then we isolated dv dt, so dv dt equals 3x plus 2v. And then we have our linear system. dx dt is equal to v, and dv dt is equal to 3 times x plus 2 times v. So it is linear, right? Like it's literally this, you know, pre-section 10.4 kind of thing where you just have your first derivative equal to a multiple of one thing plus a multiple of the other thing, and your second derivative equal to a multiple of your first variable plus a multiple of your second variable. The very kind of standard nice situation that we like to be in. And then we actually found the solutions. We said, let's find the eigenvalues. We got three and negative one. And then we found the eigenvectors, uh, one, three, and one, negative one. And then we wrote the general solution just like you normally would. We said, here's our general solution, xv equals c1 u to lambda 1 tv1 plus c2 u to lambda 1 tv2. And then we actually plugged in our v1 and v2. So there's our lambda 1 v1, our lambda 2 v2. But then we said, well, we don't actually care about what v is, right? v was this extra thing that we made up to help us solve the system. So we really only care about what x is. And looking here, x is just the top row. It's c1 e to the 3t times 1 plus c2 e to the negative t times 1. And really, that is where you should stop. This is the answer we're looking for, unless you want to find a particular solution because you have an initial condition. But then I went a little further and said, well, let's actually make sure it's a solution. So I'm going to take x and the derivative of x and the second derivative of x and plug it back into this equation here. So I plugged in my second derivative, which is equal to, sorry, you can't see it now. I plugged in my second derivative, which is equal to this down here, the 9c1 e to the 3t plus c2 e to the negative t. And I, then I subtracted two times my first derivative. And then I said it equal to three times my original function. Which is that. So that's what I'm doing here. In fact, let me just label it. Here is my second, I'm gonna write x double prime because I'm kind of out of room. That's my second derivative. There's minus two times my first derivative, and there's three times my x. This is not required or necessary, but I, I thought it was good for us to see, oh yeah, if we do this process, we actually get a solution to the original differential equation. Kind of cool. Okay. Let's do one more, and then we'll talk about a cool pattern. This next one is going to be very much the same thing we just did, but it's good to practice. Where am I? Let me stick around. They're hiding from me. Okay. And then after that, we'll talk about the graphical method a little bit. So let's say we want to do the same sort of thing. We want to solve the following second order differential equation x double prime of t minus four times x of t equals zero, which you could also write as x double prime of t equal to four times x of t. Excuse me. Um, so we're gonna do the same thing. We're going to let dx dt be equal to v, which gives us the second derivative, x double prime is equal to dv dt. which we know is equal to what? What's the second derivative of x equal to? Yeah. And you can write x or x of t. I'm gonna write this x. So we have our system. Our system is dx dt. I'm gonna write it more, more written out. Is equal to zero x plus one v and dv dt is equal to 4x plus 0v. Just to be really, really clear, this gives us our matrix A being 0, 1, 4, 0. 
Okay. Our trace is zero. Our determinant is zero minus four. Mom, wow. you can write zero minus four again. <laughs> Sorry. That's unnecessary, by the way. Okay. And so that means we can say that our lambda squared plus zero times lambda minus four equals zero. So lambda minus two times lambda plus two equals zero. So our eigenvalues are positive two and negative two. Okay, let's find the eigenvectors. So if lambda equals two, we're going to get zero, one, four, zero times x, y equal to two x, y. We're again in that kind of nice situation. In fact, most of these you're going to have this nice situation where you have a zero in the several left corner because you are always going to start off by setting dx dt equal to v. And you're going to have a zero x and a one v. That's going to work like that. So you're going to have zero times x plus one times y equal to two times x. Great. One, two is my eigenvector. Similarly, if lambda equals negative two, we're going to get that matrix equal to negative two times x, y, which is going to give us y equal to negative two x. So we get one negative two as our eigenvector. So here is our general solution. x of t, v of t equals c1 e to the lambda 1 t times 1, 2 plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t times 1, negative 2. But again, we don't actually care what the second row is. All we really care is that x of t is C1e to the 2t times 1 plus C2e to the negative 2t times 1. Now, I really want to make an observation. So let's look at these two systems we have for just a second. So the first system we had. We had the following. We had x double prime of t minus 2x prime of t minus 3x of t equal to 0. And I really want to point out, if you look back to the work we did there, our characteristic polynomial, the thing we're solving for lambda, looks very similar. We were solving. Lambda squared minus two lambda minus three equal to zero. And then the second one, our second system was x double prime of t minus zero x prime of t, I should really write out. Minus, or sorry, plus, I guess, or it's not, minus four x of t equal to zero. And we were solving the equation lambda squared minus four equal to zero. This is not a coincidence. This always happens with these kind of second order differential equations. So what you can say is to solve. Now, I should point out, I still think. I'm pretty sure Dr. Dell would like you to do this the long way, meaning showing your work, setting your DVD or uh, setting, yeah, V equal to dx dt and kind of doing all that. But it's nice to know that there is kind of a faster way to do this. Solve a second order system like this. We can look at the coefficients. of the second derivative, the first derivative, and the function, like they're the coefficients of a second degree polynomial.
or I say of a quadratic equation. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say I have this equation, x double prime of t minus five x prime of t minus six x of t equal to zero. I can find the eigenvalues not by doing all the work, although we should do all the work, but I just want to show you there is a fast way. I can say, oh, well, I can solve this lambda squared minus five lambda minus six equals zero. So then I'm going to get lambda minus six times lambda plus one equal to zero. So I'm going to get lambda equal to six, and lambda equal to negative one. And here's my solution. X of t equals C one e to the lambda one t plus C two e to the lambda two t. And I don't need the vector, well, because one, I only want the top part, but if you notice, in each of the ones we did before, both of my eigenvectors were one something and one something. Both of my eigenvectors were one something and one something. So the X parts can always be one, so you don't even have to like have a different coefficient there. It's always gonna be one something, one something. So it's kind of neat that you can do this. You can always solve a system like this, this faster way. In fact, this is a lot of what, um, not that any of you have to take math 22B, but this is what a not small part of that class talks about is solving second order linear differential equations in this way, which is kind of cool. So what I would say if you have to do a problem like this is I would maybe use this to be like, oh, I know what the answers are gonna look like. I'm, I'm definitely gonna get lambda equal to six, lambda equal to negative one because of this, but then I would probably still show the work, at least on an exam. Questions about anything I've said here? I'm gonna write down one more thing and then we will talk about the graphical approach. So generally you can solve a second order linear differential equation by doing the following. So if you have, and I'm gonna write this in two ways. So if we're given, you can either write it as X double prime of T plus A times X prime of T plus B times X of T equal to zero. Or if you prefer D squared X DT squared plus A times DX DT plus b times x equal to zero. Given either one of those, we can find the eigenvalues by solving lambda squared plus a times lambda plus b equal to zero. And the system as the general solution, x of t equal to c1 e to the lambda 1 t plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t. There is no need to write any vectors there. It is literally just these values. So kind of cool. Or you could do it the long way, right? You could say, V equals X prime, V prime equals X double prime, and then you can do the whole thing. It's going to work out the same way. One could, in fact, yeah, just, just to really, just to help convince you all that what I'm saying is not total garbage. You could do it the long way as well. You could say V equals X prime, V prime equals X double prime. And so then if I rewrite this, look what I get. I get V prime plus A times V plus B times X equal to zero. Or solving for V prime, I get DV DT equal to negative BX 
minus AV. And then my dx dt, of course, is just V. And of course, I've written this backwards. So my system looks like the following. My A is going to be 0, 1, negative B, negative A. And so then if we tried to solve that, we would say, OK, well, my determinant is 0 minus negative B. And my trace is 0 plus negative A. And so we're solving, oh, look, lambda squared minus the trace times lambda plus the determinant. It's exactly the same as that. Kind of super cool, but also not super cool. But also you can say that about a lot. What, why do they get signed out? That's weird. Are we still zooming here? Oh, well, shoot. Feels like we're still zooming. Sorry. Okay, well, I guess it's not important if we got signed out. Hopefully, hopefully you're really paying attention in case you want to watch the video later. But either. Let's see. Um, Uh -huh. Yeah, X is always, the, we're always right. Yeah, so we're always thinking, and so I know I've written this kind of backwards. I'm always thinking of writing this as, sorry. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I do, yes. I, I, try to, if I, I try to always upload the notes. So if you ever see that they're not there, let me know. Usually it takes me a couple hours because I go just drop in right after class and then I come back and then I like, scan them and upload them. But yeah, they're almost always uploaded the same day. If they're not, I'd be like, hey, James, a couple of notes, please. I'd like to look at them. So, yeah, I think this is kind of cool, but I'm a nerd. So, you know, whatever. Let's switch gears and talk about the graphical method, which we definitely started to talk about in class on Monday. Um, so, let's do this first one both ways. So, we're going to find all equilibria. of the following system, the following nonlinear system. And then we will analyze the stability of each uh, equilibria. So our system is yeah, we'll do it. I really like x's and y's, but he really likes x's, x1s and x2s. So dx1 dt equals x1 minus x2 squared, and dx2 dt equals x1 minus x2 minus 2. And I am going to call this first one f and the second one g instead of calling it f1 and f2 because it's just, it's just too much. <laughs> There's too many subscriptions for f1 and f2. We'll call the first one F and the second one. So first off, let's find the equilibria. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. We're doing it not graphically first. So, so equilibria. Hmm. Hmm. So I'm going to deal with the second one. So I'm going to set for the second one first. I don't know. You can do either one kind of. I guess I'm going to set this one equal to zero first. So x1 minus x squared equal to zero. Sorry, x1 minus x2 squared equal to zero gives me x1 equal to x2 squared. And then, hmm, sure. And then I'm gonna plug that in over here. So I'm gonna have x2 squared minus x2 minus two equal to zero. I'm gonna factor that, I'm gonna get x2 minus two times x2 plus one equal to zero. So I'm either gonna get x2 equal to 2. And if x2 is 2, then x1 is going to be 4. Or x2 equal to negative 1. If x2 is negative 1, x1 is going to be positive 1. So my equilibria are the point 4, comma, 2 and the point 1, comma, negative 1. And first, I do want to do this 
the normal, the, the normal way, the way I consider easier because I, I can actually see what's going on. So I'm gonna do this by finding the Jacobian and then plugging in my critical points and seeing if, if I have positive eigenvalues or negative eigenvalues or whatever kind of eigenvalues to help me see if I have stability or instability. So let's find the Jacobian. So my Jacobian is, okay. So again, the way I really think about doing this is I think about F being in the first row, G being in the second row, X1 in the first column, X2 in the second column. So this first entry is FX1, the second entry is FX2, this entry here is GX1, this is GX2. Whatever way works for you, but that's the way that works for you. So I'm going to get, so FX1 is 1, FX2 is minus 2X2, GX1 is 1, GX2 is negative 1. So this is gonna be relatively easy to plug in for because there's only one thing that's gonna change. So J of four, two is gonna equal one, negative two times two is negative four, one, negative one. And again, I'm probably gonna, I don't know, how am I gonna really do this? I'm gonna find the trace of the determinant. So the trace, is equal to zero. The determinant is equal to negative one minus negative four, which is equal to positive three. Trace being zero is kind of funky because that means you are, what does that mean? I mean, you're not negative, you're not positive. I mean, you're kind of on that center line. And you're, so really what I should do is find the eigenvalues. So let's see here. I'm going to do, I'm going to have lambda squared plus no lambda, right? Because my trace is zero. And then plus three equal to zero. So what kind of eigenvalues do I have? Real or imaginary? Yeah. Now, I should actually be more specific. I have purely imaginary eigenvalues. Now, if they're purely imaginary, we have a spiral. I mean, if they're imaginary at all, we have a spiral, right? Whether they're whether the real part's positive or negative or zero, you have a spiral. The real part's positive is an outward spiral, you're unstable. The real part's negative, you have an inward spiral, you're stable. If the real part's zero, you have a spirally spiral, a center, a loop. And I don't think we can actually say here if it's, yeah, like, yeah, we can't really say. So this part here is actually inconclusive. We can't actually say if this is stable or unstable. It's, I mean, you kind of think of it as being stable, right? Because you're looping around, but you kind of think it's being unstable because you're not, going in towards any one point. Because right? stability really should mean you are moving towards one point that is in equilibrium. And so this point here, four comma two, it's not really stable or unstable. You're not moving towards it, you're not moving away from it. So we say it's inconclusive. And that's typically the case when either the trace or the determinant is equal to zero is you have an inconclusive kind of system. How disappointing, never feels good. Oh well. Let's look at the other one. Let's say we plugged in one negative one. So I do J of one negative one, I'm gonna get one and then two and then one and then negative one. So here the trace is also zero, bummer. And the determinant is equal to negative one minus two, which is negative three. And if the determinant's negative, we know we have what kind of thing? Saddle. Saddle. Yeah. So we have something saddle-ish, which means we have instability. So that's what's happening there from this analytical way of seeing it, right? This is the, what I would say is the usual way of checking things out. I would hesitate. So here's what I would say about this. 
I would say that at this point here, locally, we have a center. But the problem is how local, right? Like you're around this point, but it's not a center everywhere. If you move way, way out, the system starts doing way different things because it's not linear and you have all this other, right? You have something happening around this one equilibrium, but if you move over here, you have a saddle. So I would, what I'm trying to say is, I would hesitate to say that we have a center here. I would say, well, we can't say anything. I wouldn't really say we have a saddle here, although it's acting like a saddle around this equilibrium. I would be more general and say we have instability or that it's unstable there. Now, that's because I'm kind of being cagey about it. Like I'm, I'm not trying to be too specific because I don't have to be, but Dr. Dell might want you to be more specific. He might say, oh yeah, you should just look at this and be like, I have a saddle. Like that would be fine if he says that's fine. I just, I don't know what he really is exactly looking for. And I know that in the textbook, they specifically, they don't specifically say like they have a saddle somewhere. They say, oh, I've got these conditions, it's unstable. Or, oh, I've got these conditions, it's stable. So that's what I'm trying to protect against, essentially. Let's look at the graphical method. Kind of neat. So, for the graphical method, first we're gonna draw the null clients. This is where I wish the colors showed up well. So first, draw the null clients. So again, our equations, in case you forgot what they were, our system was dx1 dt equal to x1 minus x2 squared. And if I'm setting that equal to zero, I'm thinking of, okay, I'm gonna have x1 equal to x2 squared. What I'm really thinking, because I don't love graphing in terms of x1 and x2, I'm really thinking, oh, I've got x equal to y squared. It's just going to be easier for me to graph, thinking of it that way. You wouldn't think it's that hard, but it really like using x1 and x2, I'm just like, what? I, just make your life easier on yourself. Do it a way that makes sense. Similarly, dx2 dx2 dt was equal to x1 minus x2 minus two. And we set that equal to zero. Oh, so I want to use a different color, even though you can't see it very well here, you will be able to see it when I upload the notes. So setting that equal to zero, I'm going to get, I would usually solve for x2 if I can, right? I didn't here because it didn't make sense to, but here I would say, all right, I'm gonna have x2 equal to x1 minus two. Or, y equal to x minus 2. Okay. So I'm going to graph them. Now, I do already know where they intersect because I found the points of equilibrium. They intersect at, where'd they go? Let me look back and see. They intersect at the points 4, 2, and 1, negative 1. So let's be thoughtful when we graph this. So I'm gonna get intersection here at one negative one and here at four comma two. Okay, X equals Y squared is a rightward opening parabola. It hits the point zero, zero, one, one, four, two, et cetera. And then this other one here, or this other way we go, we hit the point one negative one and so on and so on. And so on. Just as a quick reminder, I would encourage you not to draw arrows at the ends of your graphs. I know it's like, I really, really like, I want to be like arrow, arrow, because like, that's what you usually do when you draw it. But we're trying to also think about the direction of things like that. So we really don't want those arrows. They, they will be confusing to us. And then y equals x minus two has an x intercept of two, a y intercept of negative two, and it should pass through these points, which it's going to do. They don't screw it up. Perfect. Okay, and as we've seen before, and as we'll see again, where the different types of null clients cross each other is where we get the equilibrium, always. Where the same types of null clients cross each other, we do not. Not that that's an issue here, but it can be two other places. Okay, so let's take a look at the one that's a little more satisfying first. Let's look at this one here. So to do this, I feel like it typically makes sense to start at a point that is not on 
either more fun. So I'm going to start because I need something. I need, like, just like he was doing in class last Monday, he definitely needed some knowledge about what's happening in one of the areas. So I'm going to pick a point that I know is not on a null plan. I'm going to pick the point x equals 1, y equals 0. I should really say, I'm going to look at the point x1, x2 equal to 1, comma 0, just to have something. So if I do that, if I plug those in, that's going to give me dx1 dt equal to 1 minus 0, which all I really care is that it's positive, and dx2 dt equal to 1 minus 0 minus 2, which is negative 1, which is negative. So here's what I know in this section here, specifically at the point one zero. I am moving positively in the x1 direction and negatively in the x2 direction. So I'm moving right and down. And what I also know is that that is true everywhere in here, no matter what. What I think he was doing in class, and which I should also do is, if I call this one F, and I call this one G, in this region over here, F is, po uh, ooh, 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 F is positive, and G is negative. And people sometimes write this with like little plus and minus signs, where F is the top one and G is the bottom one, or you can do it like this. F is positive, G is negative. And that's true everywhere in this section. Okay. Now check this out. If I cross over this line to right over here, this line or this line that I should label, this line where g equal to dx d2, sorry, dx2 dt is zero. Well, if g is negative over here and it's zero here, it's gonna change signs on the other side. And over here, G is going to be positive. And F doesn't change signs. F is still going to be positive. Okay. So the thing is, we can do this for every little portion of this two dimensional plane. So whenever you cross over one of the null clines, that thing changes signs. So if I cross, let's actually write the other one as well. This is f equal to dx1 dt equal to zero. So now if I go from this section over here and I cross over to this section over here, f is going to go from positive to negative. g is going to stay the same. Okay, let me stop and ask you all if you have any questions or comments or something you see or don't see. I will fully admit this was very, this it still is not just was, this still is challenging for me. This was challenging for me when I tried to learn it the first time. So it really kind of just wrap my head around what is really going on here. But as simply as I can put it, when you cross a null plane of a certain type, that thing changes sign. So when I cross the X1 null plane, DX1 DT changes signs, or the thing I'm calling F changes sign. When I cross the X2 null plane, dx2 dt changes signs. It goes from negative to positive, positive to negative. But we're calling it g and f just because most of it's easier to write. So when I go over to the left side of this note line, g is going to change signs. So f is still negative, g becomes negative. Am I missing any sections? Yeah, I'm missing down here. So down here, if I cross, so if I cross from here, and, and so, so I should say, don't get fooled by the axes. Right? The axes in this problem, often the axes are null planes, not in this problem, right? This axis and this axis are really kind of, I wish I could just remove them for a second because they're not important for this process. So if I take this F being positive and G being positive and I cross this null plane where F is zero, then F changes signs from positive to negative. And G stays the same. And then finally, well, so finally, you could be like, well, then we have to cross over here as well. And I'd say, okay, the cross over here, G is going to change signs. And we get F being negative and G being negative. But that's actually still in the same region as this over here, right? All of this is the same region. 
I'm not crossing any null clients when I move anywhere over here. So I've already got what's happening there by writing it there. The fields, I know, right? But like really here, right? If I move, if I go from here and I travel over here, no null clients are being crossed. So what that means is everywhere over here, I'm going left and down. Now that not, not, might not be the perfect direction, but it's close. Or not, no, it's not close. It's just, it's, it's generally good. Here, we're going left and up. In here, we're going right and up. Down here, we're going left and up. So it's going left if the derivative in the x direction is negative. Right, if, the, if dx, so let's just say, D, let's just say x and y instead of x, y, and if dx dt is negative, the change in x is negative, meaning x is moving to the left. And if dy dt is negative, then it's going down because the change in y is negative. So f being the x thing and g being the y thing, if f and g are both positive, I'm moving right for f being positive and up for g being positive. If F is negative and G is positive, I'm moving left for F being negative because F is the X thing and up for G being positive. You're right. I could pick lots of points. The problem is twofold. One, you're not always given the differential equations in this process. So if I don't actually have these equations, then I have to do this thing. And two, once you get good at it, it is faster to do it this way. I don't want to plug in point here, point here, point here, point here, right? It's going to be a problem. So now, yes, okay, we're almost out of time, but I just want to say one thing. So now I can try to look at what the Jacobian would be at that point. So let's look specifically at one negative one. Okay, so this is where it's really important to remember that the first row is F, the second row is G, the first column is X1, the second column is X2. So right here, I'm going to put del f del x1 and so on and so on okay so del f del x1 says how is f changing as x1 changes so x1 is the x direction so at this point how are things changing as x1 changes so as i as i increase x1 this is x1 is increasing. How is f changing? Well, look, over here, f is negative. Over here, f is positive. So f changed. It went from negative to positive. It increased. So if something increases, its derivative is, help me out, right. So del f del x1 has to be positive. And then I can ask, if I go in the x2 direction, upward instead of rightward, how is f changing as x2 is increasing? Well, if I go from here to here, f goes from negative to positive. So f increased, so its derivative is positive. Okay, we're almost done. And then we do the same things for g. So if I go from left to right, how is g changing? Well, g is going from negative over here to positive over here, also positive. And then finally, as I go from bottom to top, right in the x2 direction, how is g changing? It's going from positive to negative. So the derivative of g is negative because it decreased. So there is my Jacobian or my, you know, my pseudo Jacobian. And then I can say, okay, well, the determinant of this is a negative number minus a positive number. Oh, look, that determinant is a negative minus a positive, but the negative minus positive is definitely negative. And we know if the determinant is negative, we have a saddle or more generally instability. So this is what we can get from the graphical method. You can say at this point, I have something saddle-like. I have instability because I can see that the determinant is negative. And so this is why that theorem 16 in section 10.4 is kind of useful because you can be like, oh, I can find the determinant and the trace, or I can, I can sometimes tell the sign of the determinant and the trace and be like, oh, determinant is negative, trace is positive, 
good to go. It's, un un it's unstable. Or determines positive, traces negative, good to go. It's stable. So that's kind of what we're doing with this. All right, I should stop talking. It's 202.